Welcome to One Symphony, a podcast that explores classical music's relevance in our modern lives. I'm conductor Devin Patrick Hughes, and I'm here to share with you stories and conversations with musicians, composers, and artistic entrepreneurs that aim to unite us into one symphonic world. Brittany J. Green is a North Carolina-based composer, creative, and educator. Her music facilitates intimate musical spaces that ignite visceral responses at the intersection of sound, video, movement, and text. Recent works engage sonification and black feminist theory as tools for sonic world building, exploring the construction, displacement, and rupture of systems. Her artistic practice includes spoken and electronic performance, interdisciplinary collaboration, experimental projects, and acoustic and electroacoustic chamber and large ensemble works. Her music has been featured at Time Spans, NYC Electronic Music Festival, Woco Fest, and Experimental Sound Studio. Her collaborators include the International Contemporary Ensemble, Jack Quartet, Transient Canvas, Castle of Our Skins, Emory University Symphony, and Wachovia Winds. Brittany holds awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, ASCAP Foundation, and New Music USA. She is a doctoral candidate at Duke University, pursuing a PhD in music composition as a Dean's Graduate Fellow. I'm excited to welcome Brittany Green on One Symphony Podcast today. Brittany, it's so great to have you on the podcast and to be able to interview you. I'd just love to start by asking you about your role as a composer, performer, educator, narrator. It sounds a lot like when we think of Leonard Bernstein, for example. Can you talk about how you grew into all those different roles and maybe also why that's important today for artists to have so much versatility? Sure. First off, I'm excited to be here. It's great to join you today. My trajectory thus far has been a bit of an interesting one. When I went to school for undergrad, I actually went to school for music education. Originally, that was the plan to get into K-12 education. After I graduated, I actually did teach for a few years and then decided I want to try composing. That's something I've always really been interested in. And I just want to see what happens if I pivot. At the time, I was still in my early 20s and it was the perfect time to try it. And then if it didn't work out, just go back to teaching. From there, I pivoted a little bit more toward composition. Something that was really exciting that I got to do during that time was a project called the Young Composers Project. With that, I was able to blend those two worlds of composition and education. I worked with K-5 through students in small groups, and we composed music together. We built drum machines in Max MSB and made music with those drum machines. That was a really exciting way to explore what it would mean to be an educator as a composer and how that could tie into this broader body of work that I was interested in doing. That is what brought those two worlds together, teaching through mentorship, teaching in my TA position at Duke, and also whenever I get a chance to do residencies and travel, connecting with students that way. It's just something that I find really fulfilling and important. It's important for us to as much as we output our own creative interests into the world to help nurture and support the artistic interests of others, particularly of students, and just really being able to support them and and give feedback and mentorship and, and advice. That's something that's really important to me. While all of that was happening, I really got into performing primarily through live electronics And this is during COVID where everything was shut down. We're all at home alone and you're craving that sense of live music, but it's not possible in the way that it had been happening before. I'd already been really interested in electronic work, electroacoustic work. In being at home, I just really delved into performing with electronics and really got interested in that and developed that. And through that, also engaging with narration as a form of performance as well particularly just enjoying the works of artists like Miri Baraka, Sonia Sanchez, more from the Black arts poetry space, and really excited to explore what it would mean to bring some of that into my more classical aesthetics in terms of music. 
all of those things happened at COVID and at this point congealed into this robust network of things that I do. There's no clear straight path for most of us usually just being able to do multiple things and specifically multiple things that you enjoy and find interest in is always really helpful. And it's also nice because sometimes I don't feel like composing, but I can perform or sometimes I don't feel like performing, but I can lean into composing. I'm able to get that creative rest and then also that creative inspiration and reinvigoration through doing these other things that I can then bring back to composing or performing or teaching. Your music explores the construction, displacement, and rupturing of systems. When I think of breaking a mold, a lot of times we think about classical music as being this mold or box, but every major composer along the historical line has been somebody who has ruptured things, who has broken things. I think of Beethoven as the first example of that, breaking out of the classical box and creating romanticism. Can you talk about how one does that in the 21st century or how you do that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways you can do it. In one way, it feels like a daunting task at this point in music history because so many structures have been built and broken <laughs> by this point. But in another way, I find that really exciting to really parse out and think about what are new ways that I can explore those concepts. Fundamentally, that's what great music is. It's the setup of expectation and the deviation from that. I find a lot of excitement in that. For me, that unfolds in looking at rhythmic structures that I can build over time and then slowly dismantle or maybe quickly dismantle and completely break and explore what music comes out of that breakage in that slippage of rupture. I find that really interesting. But you can think of it in a lot of different ways. I also like thinking of it in terms of timbre and texture and what it means to build this sonic world, this textural world, and then deviate from it somehow or allow something to cut through and break through. We've seen a lot of systems get destroyed in the past five or six years. I like to shift, unravel, break for clarinet, violin, cello, and piano. I'd love to hear how you create this concept from an oral standpoint. I love that concept just as a human or artist, some part of us or thing that always has to be destroyed to create a new. So for that piece in particular, I actually used an algorithmic tool to generate the musical material. It starts with this flowy legato material that was basically being generated through this generative practice. And then I start to actually break that algorithm down, which ends up generating this more rhythmic pockety material. So that was the way that I approached it in that piece, but it's not always in that particular way, but in that particular piece. Another piece that has that just edge, obviously in the title, but in the music is Against Sharp. You took some words from Zora Neale Hurston. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. And you talk about how you feel like this in classical music in general. Can you talk about how you express that in the piece Against Sharp? Sure. So in that piece, I was really interested in exploring what material would emerge out of a breakage, like area of slippage. In that piece, you hear this very incessant rhythmic and even pitch material emerge, the, these repeated Bs, da -da 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 -da, and they just will not stop. And the sound world builds off of that. But then you start to hear these other gestures, these introductions of different pitches, these introductions of different rhythmic ideas, a lot of two against three, three against four, emerging out of that to dilute that incessant rhythm. Towards the end, you hear this legato cello line emerge out of that material, and it really just starts to erode and break down. I like to think of it as water beating up against a rock, just eroding the rock. And as that breaks, harmonic material emerges at the end. For me, that was really fun to explore musically, but also as an intellectual exercise, particularly thinking of the works of scholars like Bell Hooks and Jose Munoz, 
and this idea of finding oneself and reading oneself at the margins and what it means to expand those margins in systems of domination and what can emerge out of that. What are the ways that those areas of marginality can rupture or disrupt or remold or retool a system? And I just found that really exciting to explore mentally, but also musically and to really think about what does it mean for this musical material to be in opposition with this sort of musical system that's been established within the context of the piece and how it unfolds. A fundamental disidentification and unfolding out from scrambling and reconstructing a technology of self. Sharp. How would you say margins are evolving in terms of classical music, maybe relative to the rest of the culture? Yeah, I don't think there's one specific answer. I find there's different experiences in different pockets. Chamber music has really taken off in terms of breaking the mold musically, but also in terms of representation. And you've seen a lot of really creative things you wouldn't have expected to see five or 10 years ago, at least for me personally emerge out of that space. Orchestra is starting to move in that direction a little bit slower, which makes sense. Big institutions tend to take a little bit longer than a group of four or five people, for sure. So it's been trending in the right direction. Obviously, we still have a lot of ground to cover, but it's been interesting and exciting to witness and be a part of that forward momentum. You have a thing called community-engaged residencies, which you're working with multiple orchestras throughout the country. Can you maybe talk about what that means for you as an artist, but also for the community and the orchestra that facilitates your communication with the community and maybe any aspects of those programs that you find are paramount or the most successful? Yeah, so something for me that's always really important to think about in terms of community engagement is that first word, community. A lot of times historically in the past, we've approached community engagement as we are coming to you and bestowing our greatness onto you. But I think it's really important to just really be in dialogue with communities and say, hey, this is this thing we're really good at, or these are these things we're really good at. What is it that you guys would benefit from us given our strengths? community-engaged residencies, one of my favorite things about them and one of the things that (laughs) makes them unique each time is really engaging with the community and tailoring the events and the engagements based off of the needs, desires, and interests of specific communities. So sometimes that looks like doing hands-on workshops. Sometimes that looks like doing things like the Young Composers Project, where we're teaching kids how to write music and growing and expanding what they already know about music. Sometimes that looks like a lecture recital. Sometimes that looks like talks or panels. Just being able to offer all of these different things and tailor them specific to the community's needs and specific to the strengths of the orchestra or the particular institution or ensemble that I'm working with is like by far the most exciting part for me. Each time it's a little bit different But it's something that I find really exciting and a really important way of engaging with communities, really looking at the work that we're doing as a collaboration, looking at our art audiences as collaborators and stakeholders and approaching it from that standpoint instead of just fixed, this is what we do and we're just going to show up and do our thing and folks can either come or don't come or take it or leave it. There is something really special about if you can finding someone that's already within the community to be a collaborator on these projects because they have an intimate understanding of the community and the area and the region. There is also something really nice about working with folks who are not in the area who maybe can bring in fresh perspectives and new ideas, particularly if they are not from the area but are from an area that's similar in terms of demographic or something like that. The other thing that's important to remember is it's not always an either or. You could even explore partnerships with people who maybe you've seen them do something somewhere else and thought, man, that would really be impactful in my community. 
you can bring them in and partner them with a community member and together they can collaborate and create something really interesting. Other things that I think are important is just identifying potential stakeholders in the area. Something that's really special about regional orchestras is that it is a little bit closer to the community. You're able to connect with maybe local institutions like colleges or high schools, other ensembles that are local. Even if they're amateur ensembles, they don't necessarily have to be professional ensembles. The really nice thing about a regional orchestra is it's easier to be a little bit more aware of those things that are happening on the ground and you can come in and support those things that are already happening, but also collaborate with those folks to really build something meaningful that reverberates throughout the region and throughout the community. And I think it's easier to do when we bring in more stakeholders and connect and find areas that we align and and build out programming and engagements and resources that can support those things. There was an article recently in the New York Times, and this is pretty standard in American orchestras for most of their existence, starting with the Chicago Symphony, the New York Philharmonic, when they were founded, basically being all German orchestras. It seems that American music directors, for instance, are very rare. Canada, it's different. They're really focused on getting Canadians to be there in their artistic positions. Same places, Hungary and Europe and South America, to some extent, it's more global. But I'm curious, for example, there's Jonathan Hayward, who's the music director of the Baltimore Symphony, who's an American. Aside from that, in major orchestras, it's really hard to find that. I think the arts have always been obsessed with whatever the exotic currently is. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. And I do remember that New York Times article. And it's something that you see even in terms of music from the composition standpoint. It's this thing we've always been bumping up against for at this point over 100 years. What is America's place in classical music? And how do we carve out our own path? Or is that even something that we want to do? I imagine some folks maybe aren't particularly interested in that. But it's always interesting to think about how do we shape American classical music as its own thing and prop up, promote and support American artists. It's always something that's been a point of contention. But for me, I find it something that's really important as a composer. A lot of my favorite artists and composers are American composers. Moving through the academy, even that stance is difficult. It's like, oh, I really like this American composer's music. Oh, but have you heard of this European composer? And nothing wrong with European composers. There's certainly plenty that I enjoy, but it's always inferiority in which American music seems to be referenced with, in my experience. I think that's something that goes all the way back to the way we are engaging in the academy and the things that we're prioritizing the type of pedigrees, for lack of a better word, that we're prioritizing. And I think it's a real shame. I would love to see five years from now, 10 years from now, what it would look like if that wasn't the case. And we supported American conductors, American composers a little bit more because there's so many talented American conductors that just have really interesting musical ideas. I can recall several times working with American conductors in more chamber orchestra settings and thinking, wow, this person needs to be in front of somebody's orchestra. Just blown away by the way that they're able to really tease out the musical material, the ideas and approaches that they're bringing to the rehearsal space and to the performance space. And it's just a shame that those folks aren't getting more opportunities. A 
lot of orchestras are really trying to play American music and do as much newer stuff as maybe the old stuff. How much of it is the role of the orchestra to lead its community or the orchestra to follow the community and what it quote unquote wants? Can you maybe talk about any experiences you've had or your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's one of those things that I feel like is always presented as a binary. And I wonder what if we looked at it as a yes and? You can really build meaningful programming around pairing older works with new works, particularly older works with new works that you wouldn't necessarily at first think to pair together, but you could create some interesting connections and you can even build programming around those performances, whether it's through some sort of pre-concert talk, for example, to help the audience see those connections. I think that slowly opens the door to bring folks into music that they wouldn't have otherwise uh, considered or thought about. But I do think part of it is also just folks don't know what they don't know and why not have a concert that's all new music and also understanding that new music is an incredibly vague term. Sometimes when we think new music, people are thinking the most experimental, abstract, avant-garde sound possible. There certainly is new music that fits that mold, but there's also new music that you listen to it and it could sound like it was written a hundred years ago. I'm not saying that as a pejorative, but just as a descriptor to say that there's just a wide range of what it means for a piece to be new music. It simply just has to have been recently composed. There's so much genre and aesthetic choice within that, that you could pick and draw from to support what your audience is typically interested in or what your perception of that is. I think a lot of audiences appreciate you as the orchestra introducing them to new things. I know for me, if I were going to a concert series or sitting in a class and in the seminar, I only heard music that I was already familiar with or the concert series over a summer, for example, I only heard music that either was music I already knew or similar sounding. I would think, oh, that was cool. I enjoyed listening to it, but I didn't get anything out of that. I personally find it really exciting to go to a concert and think, whoa, what is that piece? Who is that composer? I've never heard of that before. I'm excited about that. I want to listen more and learn more. We don't give our audiences enough credit in thinking that they can't handle that experience. I think they actually would enjoy it quite a bit. You're working with Alarm Will Sound, which is an amazing new music ensemble. I'm curious just about a lot of themes that you factor into your works, in this case, power, censorship, myth, and science. And I also, of course, love how music always brings together themes that we never thought could be related. Can you talk about in this particular project, the idea of blurring lines, classical musicians or orchestral musicians or conductors or performers or soloists? We're all used to being told what to do, to following instructions and trying to realize a composer that no longer exists <laughs> in being able to reveal those intentions. Can you talk about the idea of following instructions as a classical music performer and what happens when those lines start to get blurred, for instance, with your project with Alarm Will Sound? Yeah, so I was really interested in investigating that boundary that we have between composer and performer and who is deciding what happens and who is simply doing what has been already been decided. I also was interested in exploring that in relation to technology and the ways in which we engage with computers. And <laughs> I had the idea of this before this like exponential takeoff of AI. Fascinating to think about now in the context of how AI has just exponentially grown to a place where we have to consider those things in that context. But I was interested in what does it mean for the performer to have agency within a piece of music and to say, no, I'm not going to play that. I'm going to play this instead. So that piece allows performers to opt into either following the musical material, which will be dictated by a computer program, 
or simply refusing to follow it and improvise instead and play their own thing. But they also can decide I'm going to completely opt out of the piece completely and I'm not going to play at all. I was interested in exploring the blurring of those boundaries and what does it mean for the performer to have autonomy and say, no, I'm not going to play this. I'm going to play this instead. But they're still performing and operating within the context of the piece. Even the decisions that they're making themselves, those decisions are determined by the piece in some way, whether it be they're playing something complementary to the other music that's happening, or even if they decide I'm going to play something completely different in opposition, that opposition is still in relation to the music that's happening. How do we actually exert any autonomy within, in this case, this musical system, but even thinking more broadly within a societal system, within a relationship between human and technology at this stage in our lives where the two are so intertwined? I was really interested in exploring that. Working with the Larmor Sound has been really great because they're fantastic readers, but also fantastic improvisers. They felt really comfortable existing in that space that for us classical musicians, is often a very uncomfortable space of improvisation because it sometimes is so different from the way we've been trained and have practiced our craft. Underscore, underscore, left over, parentheses, parentheses. C8, underscore, left over, left over, left over, left over, left over. Defined as, defined as, defined as, defined as, defined as. I want to get your take on how artificial intelligence that can create music or sound, uh, how do you think that will interact with composers in the future or play a role in their job security? There are people who have already been using machine learning and even chat GPT models for composition. I remember hearing about folks using it five or six years ago, and maybe they've been doing it even before that, and I just wasn't aware But the level of sophistication that it's at right now is far beyond what it was even two years ago. The two things that make human music interesting that I imagine would be hard to replicate with ChatGPT is one, this idea of not doing what's expected. And that's something that, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, dates all the way back to Beethoven, probably even before this idea of this is what I'm supposed to do here, but I'm not going to do that. And that human element of even in knowing that you're going to deviate, not knowing how someone's going to deviate. I think that is what creates music that's interesting. Sure, AI can create music that sounds correct from a theoretical standpoint. Is it able to create music that's really interesting, that hinges on that human element of the unexpected? I think would be difficult. But the other thing about music that I think is difficult to replicate with AI is just the tactile, physical humanness of it. The experience of playing in an ensemble, which is not to be biased, an experience I think everyone should have. There's just something about sitting in a room with other musicians, whether it be a full orchestra or a quartet or or whatever, and the physicality of playing through music together, that communal experience is something that you have to physically do and to feel. And it's a very unique feeling that I don't think is replicated anywhere else. If we focus on that physical communal experience of music, even bringing audience members in, I think about going to church and everyone standing up and singing and clapping together. And that physical, very visceral experience of sound, physically feeling the sound waves, but also that communal experience, that emotional feeling of being in music together with others is something very human and very physical that can't be replicated in AI. So I think if we focus on bringing that back to the forefront, that is, I think, our path forward instead of thinking of music in in these other ways that are a little bit more replicable in AI. You do an incredible job of incorporating other mediums. I'm just thinking of Thresh and Hold, the film, which is incredible in its use of poetry and recordings, and then Garden on Green Street with tenor sax and live electronics. Can you talk about how you incorporate this idea of storytelling, even improv, but then also dip into these other mediums? 
Yeah, so for me, something that I find really musical and exciting is the sound of the human voice. I've always been fascinated with exploring the use of voice recordings as a musical instrument or even a sound to be engaged with and manipulated within a piece of work. And then when you add on top of that, the narrative capabilities of doing that, that's where Garden on Green Street came from. I wanted to record my mother and my aunt talking about their childhood because I felt it would be beautiful generations down the line to have these stories that they always tell recorded and for like their great grandchildren to be able to hear their voices even after they're long gone. But as they were talking, I called them up and put them on three ray and recorded them. And as they were talking, I was just fascinated by the sounds of their voices, voices that I've heard for 30 years, but it's very musical. And I wanted to explore what it would mean to make a piece with those voices. And on top of it being a piece that I enjoy musically, it's also this very almost spiritual experience to play that piece for me because they talk so much about my grandparents who both passed away before I was born. So I never have met them, but through playing that piece, it's almost like I'm in conversation with my grandparents. I find that a really fascinating way to engage with music when we look beyond the sonic properties and what does it mean emotionally to sit in a musical sound world and what that can do for us. And I think voice recordings are really fun way to do that. Also find that multimedia looking at video and dance is another way to do that for Thresh and Hold. I was able to connect with a poet, Marlanda DeKine, who at the time had just written a book of poetry by the same name and was interested in making something to accompany that book. We ended up connecting with a filmmaker, Makia Green, and they were able to go down to South Carolina to Marlanda's family land and record a lot of video of that land and the community around her family's land. And while they were there, also record a lot of sounds on the land. So the sounds of chains that were on the ground, the buildings, all sorts of things, rocks and things that they found on the land. And then sent that to me and I was able to construct this sound world out of that material. I know, I know, I know that this is the courage my granddaddy prayed for. Which is very fun musically to listen to and also to make, but it also has this other element, this ephemeral experience of what does it mean for me to use my family's land as an instrument? Because that's essentially how the land was working in the sound of the film, to just derive all this musicality out of this place that holds so many memories, so many generational memories, positive memories. I think they said there were some family members born on that land, negative memories of thinking about the antebellum South and escaping slavery onto that land. It's really interesting to sit in all of that through the sound of the music. I find it just super fun and fascinating and introspective. And it's a really exciting way for me to engage as a composer. And hopefully for audiences, it's really interesting to experience as well. The end, I like to just talk about in the beginning, composers have tried to depict creation or whatever the beginning is, whether it be biblical or scientific. I think of Stravinsky, The Rite of Spring and Haydn creation, I think of when Beethoven premiered his Creatures of Prometheus, Haydn supposedly remarked to Beethoven, it will never be a creation. Can you talk about how you envision the idea of creation, particularly in the beginning or yourself philosophically or spiritually, and how that resulted in this music? Yeah. So for me, it's interesting because actually, I think if I'm remembering correctly, I wrote the piece and then named the piece after in this particular case. But after I wrote the piece, as I was listening to it, it just made me think of the idea of creation from a scientific standpoint in the beginning of just starting with something so small and everything happening to happen in the correct way to expand into life on the earth over millions of years. I was really fascinated by that 
and my association with that as I listened back and thought back on the piece and it's starting from this very spacious, small place and then expanding into this bigger sonic landscape throughout the piece. That's a little bit of working backwards that I did with that piece of writing it and then thinking, huh, this makes me really makes me think of this particular thing. Like maybe I should give it a title that's related to that somehow. Why the bassoon solo in the wedged in there? Yeah, so that is actually something that emerged out of that very particular collaboration that commissioned that piece. So I was working with the Emory University Symphony, and I had sent some drafts of some material in the fall semester. They sent back some recordings, and I was talking with the director, Paul Bassan, and he was like, yeah, our bassoonist is really good. And I was like, okay, that's cool to keep in mind. But as I listened to the recordings of the drafts I sent, one of which had a, a little solo that I moved throughout different woodwind instruments, and I listened to the bassoon one, and I was like, yeah, he's really good. I was like, I need to write a solo for him in this piece because he was just fantastic. So that was like one of those things that emerged out of this non-musical <laughs> idea, but I think ended up working out really well and was exciting. And that's something that I love about whenever I get to work with an ensemble, like over a longer period of time where you can highlight the specialties in that ensemble. There are a lot of other things in that piece as well that were written specifically for uh, specific either performers or sections in the ensemble, things that I gained from the recordings of the drafts that they would sound really good doing. I was able to incorporate that, which was really exciting. That's cool. Brittany, it's been amazing to talk to you, and I really appreciate your embodiment of the full artist and all the various means you're able to communicate and all the various people you're able to reach with your music and your teaching. And I look forward to working with you and hearing about your work in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast coming on today and chatting a little bit about music and looking forward to seeing everything that you do as well moving forward. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on One Symphony. Thanks to Brittany J. Green for sharing her music and spirit. You can find more info at www.brittanyjgreen.com. Musical selections on the episode today include Brittany J. Green Portrait for Piano with Brandon Banks at the piano, Brittany Green's Shift Unravel Break from featured music from Copeland House with Morin Katz, Paula Garcia, Alexis Pia Gerlach, and Margaret Campmeyer. Brittany Green's Thresh and Hold with Marlanda DeKine, produced by Castle of Our Skins. You can always find more info at onesymphony.org, including a virtual tip jar if you'd like to support the show. Please rate, review, or share the show. Until next time, thank you for being a part of the music.